Hello everyone, welcome back to this wonderful journey of computer organization and architecture. In this session, we will be focusing on memory. So, let's get to learning. Wikipedia states, memory is the faculty of brain by which data or information is encoded, stored and retrieved when needed. Similarly, in case of computers, memory which was initially termed as store plays a similar role. Everything, be it an image, an audio file, a text file or instructions for a key press or a mouse click, if that is stored in the computer memory, it's actually encoded as bits. Basically, each memory cell can have either 0 or 1. And all these are comprised of millions of bits and processed by the processor, the brain of the computer. So we might think that having a single large memory unit is the solution to this situation. But I'm afraid it's not. With the increasing size of the memory, the time to access them gets increased. And time is the essence here. Let me put it to you this way. We know the processor is very fast. I mean, today we have gigahertz processors even in our smartphones. Suppose we have 2 gigahertz processor. This means the frequency is 2 gigahertz. Hence, time is 1 upon frequency. That is, 1 by 2 into 10 to the power 9. Now, how did I get this 10 to the power 9? Let's have a chart, shall we? We know 1 kilo unit equals to 1000 units, hence 10 cube units. Therefore, 1 mega unit is 1000 kilo units and thus 10 to the power 6 units. And finally, 1 giga units is 1000 mega units and thus 10 to the power 9 units. Now, coming back to our initial illustration, 1 upon 2 into 10 to the power 9 seconds equals to 1 by 2 into 10 to the power minus 9 seconds. And 10 to the power minus 9 seconds is 1 nanosecond. Therefore, in half a nanosecond, our processor can perform a single task. So, to conclude, the CPU is fast. Not only fast, real fast. And keeping up with this kind of speed is tough. Because if our memory device is way slower than the CPU, then the CPU will remain idle for the most of the time and we won't have an efficient machine. Also, not only the speed, the size and the cost are considered too when it comes to memory. That's why we have various memory devices associated to our computer. Computer designers term the memory to perform immediate tasks as primary memory. And the memory which is used as a more permanent storage is known as secondary memory. When we play an audio file, our system manager, that is the operating system, manages the space within the primary memory to perform the instructions, which is understanding the mouse click opening up the default application for playing the file after bringing it from the secondary storage into the primary memory. Now, as because we need the execution of the instructions to be as quick as possible, the sales in the primary memory can be accessed in any order. And that's why the name Random Access Memory or RAM. To be precise, it's actually Dynamic RAM. Because in each memory chip, there is a transistor with which a capacitor is associated. The transistors can retain the binary bit as long as the associated capacitors have charge. So, periodic recharging is needed for value retention. And that's why it's called dynamic. But it's still slow for the modern day processors. So, we opt for another fast memory storage, the cache. Now, the cache is made up of static RAM which doesn't have any capacitors, but they are very costly in comparison to the main or primary memory. However, cache happens to be the fastest memory storage among all others. Anyway, all these, be that cache or main memory, are volatile. That means they can only retain the data in them until the power is off. Therefore, to store the data more permanently, we opt for the next type of memory storage, the secondary memory. Now, secondary memories are slower than the main memory, yet they can retain data permanently. That is, the data inside them are still there even if the power is off. They are larger in terms of capacity. Also, they are cheaper than the main memory. We will definitely get into the detailed study of various types of secondary memories in our due course. 
But for the time being, I'd like to take an example of one of the most popular secondary storage devices that is the hard disk drive to explain one of the reasons why these are slower compared to the main memory. For a hard disk drive, the access is semi-random. Now why is so? Because using this read write head, we can randomly get to any of these tracks, but from there, getting to the particular block where the data is stored requires sequential movement. So the time to access any data in the hard disk drive becomes longer naturally. Now let me show you the big picture. We have the processor and it has got its registers, but these are not capable of storing large amount of data. To be really honest, they can barely store a single instruction. So we opt for main memory. Yet main memory is also slow for the processor. So we stored the frequently accessed TERFs in a smaller yet faster than main memory speed memory storage, the cache. It's like keeping our phones in our pockets instead of the backpack that we are carrying because we tend to use the phone very frequently. Now the main memory and the cache communicates using data word or block. And the ways the communication takes place is known as cache memory mapping. Worry not, we will learn every type of these in details later. So having this organization does speed things up a notch. But none of these retain data permanently. So we need a permanent non-volatile storage, the secondary memory. Using the virtual memory mapping technique, the operating system lets the main memory and the auxiliary secondary storage communicate with one another using pages. For this to happen, the operating system must be capable of performing paging or demand paging. Fun fact, the processor is aware of the presence of the registers, the caches, even the main memory, but it has got no clue about the existence of the secondary memory. There, the operating system comes at rescue and manages all the things. So, to conclude, having a single large memory is not really a solution. Instead, we use different types of storage units in an organized fashion. So, that was all for this session. In the next one, we will get into the details of these memory storages and learn about the memory hierarchy. Hope to see you in the next one. Thank you all for watching.